John Colm is joining us from Team Results USA. I've known John for a good long time now. He is a staunch supporter of Montgomery College and of our program at Montgomery College, um, the Southern Management Leadership Program. He's also a global best-selling author and the founder and CEO of Team Results USA, um, which is a widely acclaimed team development organization. Um, their clients include Toyota, Pfizer, Polo Ralph Lauren, Johnson & Johnson, and a ton of government agencies as well. His background um, is that he worked in the defense community for 10 years. He ran missions in the field. He's the former operations director of Australia's FDA, and you'll get to enjoy his lovely Australian accent as soon as we get started. <laughs> um, and in 1996, uh, John founded Team Results with a former fighter pilot, Peter Ring, and the company now runs team development programs on four continents. He's also been running a webinar series since um, we've had the, um, <clears throat> the, the situation with us all being uh, working remotely to help teams do their work in this new um, remote environment. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening, and it's lovely to chat to all of you. Uh, what Professor Rizavi asked me to speak about tonight is uh, teamwork in virtual space. Is it the same? Is it different? Is there anything we can learn? Has everything changed completely? Or do the eternal verities still apply? And what about the future? And what are some practical tips? For the purpose of today, uh, I am assuming that I'm talking to uh, a group of students and entrepreneurs. Would I be right about that, Rebecca? I think you're absolutely right. Yep. All right, good. So then there's one other question that should be added to all of those, which is the important one, which is, which is and what can you do about it? Because as entrepreneurs, people are looking to us above all else to lead, whether we feel like it or not, and to answer the question, well, what can I do about it? And they look at us and we're supposed to know because we're the entrepreneurs. So let's talk about that for a little bit. The first thing I'm going to try and do is a screen share um, because there's a quote that I want you to see and think about. And let me see if I can make that work, like so. Rebecca, let me confirm that you can see a thing that yes. says team life in virtual space. I, it looks like we're about to, uh, yes, a, a string that's about to break. A string that's about to break and the rope represents the human connections and the workspaces that we used to have a few months ago and we'll have again, but not for a while. And all of those things were the things that bound us together, the created tribe and community and collaboration and cooperation and synergy and spontaneity and the emergence of great ideas that seem to come from nowhere and are really the consequence of putting a number of bright people together in the same space and time, providing with a glass of wine seldom hurts and then leaving them alone. And that's where they come up with really good ideas. Well, we can't do that anymore. So if the rope represented the connections we used to have, then slowly over time for our own safety, strands of the rope have become cut one after the other. We couldn't gather in large groups, then we couldn't gather in small groups, then we couldn't meet in a workplace at all. Um, then we, uh, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't do training face-to-face -face anymore. So we lost all those synergies. And now even the internet is beginning to be chipped away at. Since school came back two weeks ago, uh, the internet has become quite flaky. And those of you who aren't aware of that, I promise you that is the experience of some of our big clients, particularly big government departments, big corporations. I won't name them, it wouldn't be fair, but they are names you all know. And they are finding that they can't do things like have an all hands meeting uh, successfully with everyone participating online because the bandwidth in the system simply won't sustain it. And when they try, the thing crashes. So it's not just virtual communication anymore, it's restricted, limited, Constrained virtual communication. You can't show your face because if everyone shows their face, the system breaks. So instead we have to look at still avatars and communicate in chat. And uh, not 10 minutes before starting tonight's webinar, I just got off a communication with a major client on how we're going to handle that very issue that they have. So everything's been taken away from us. And that's what the last remaining strand is supposed to represent the internet. But even that strand is fraying. And you're going to see more of that because the internet was not designed for what we're using it for. Neither were our computers, neither was your home connection. Your home connection was for watching Netflix. Internet was for its normal load. The accounts that large organizations have with WebEx 
or Adobe Connect or whatever it is, were designed for a normal load. Now they're grossly overloaded and there's no opportunity to rebuild things in the time we have. One other thing I wanted to show you was this quote from an author named Susan Pinker. And I'd urge you to go out and get yourself a copy of her book. If you can, you can get it online. If you have an ebook reader, it's not expensive. Um, I don't like reading quotes out. So before I do, let me just say that this is for people who are dialing in and can't see a screen. If you can see a screen, then I apologize for reading the quote. But Susan Pinker said, digital networks and screen media have the power to make the world seem much smaller. But when it comes to certain life-changing transformations, they're no match for face-to-face. So let's not be in any illusions at all about being constrained. It's like being a plumber and asked to put in a hot water service. Fine, you know how to do that. But now the client takes your spanner away. And you think, oh, well, this is going to be harder. And then the client takes your torch away. Well, how am I going to brace pipes? And then the client takes your hammer away. Okay. And then the client takes your shoes away. And eventually you're trying to install the hot water service using a plastic fork. That's where we are today. Again, I'd strongly recommend that you read uh, Susan Pinker. Here are some things that um, we have learned and the clients have learned about living in a virtual world over these past few months. The first of these is to pick a single technology and stick with it. Um, a lot of people are bouncing around. A lot of people are throwing spaghetti at a wall and hoping something sticks. And when they do find something that sticks, they're saying, right, everybody jump on Zoom. As though we all knew how to use it. As though we all had the same understanding and brought the same cultural paradigms to it. What organizations have found out the hard way is that that's not true. And everything from understanding the culture to understanding the technology has been a problem if there's no unification. So effort has to be put in to getting people to learn that platform. You don't hire four pilots and tell them they're all flying 737s without giving them training on the 737. The result will be disastrous. And the same thing here too. So if you're trying to get people to work together in a virtual environment, you need to invest in their competence with the technology, first things first. The skill set also for managing teams face to face is not the same as it is for managing teams virtually. Um, when we manage teams face to face and you talk to a team of 20 people, you can use orator voice and you can dress well and you can impress them and stand in front of them and say, well, folks, I suppose you're wondering why I've gathered you all here today. And this is a skill set that all of us work to develop very hard. I have spent a lifetime in performance. Um, I used to, I started in radio, uh, doing voice performance on radio. And you spend a lifetime honing these public speaking skills. They are less relevant now because you're not really speaking to 20 people even when you're speaking to 20 people. The essential transaction in an online environment, and this might be the most important point I have today, is retail. It's me to you. Now, there are 19 other yous out there, but each of you is an individual. You're not a group of 19. So the nature of the transaction that exists between us is personal. It's me talking directly to you, not to a group of 20 people, even if there are 20 of you. It's 20 individual conversations that happen to be occurring simultaneously. But every person's experience is a personal experience. And if you have any training in performance, you'll know that I'm talking to about the difference between stage acting and movie acting. Stage acting is all about big voice and presence and big gestures and being seen and let's go over there and follow us to the brave new world with whatever we're doing in an organization. Whereas movie acting and movie performance, individual communication is always about two things. And those two things are the face and the hands. Why a lot of performers wear all black when they go on the air. Robin Williams loved to do this to focus attention on the face or the hands, because that's where all the human communication is up close. When you're talking to a team on stage, no one can see if you're rolling your eyes and looking completely bored because they're too far away. But when it's a human transaction, these things are not just eloquent, they're essential. So it's retail business, not wholesale business. That's the biggest change you're gonna see as you try to navigate a virtual world, every single transaction now is a retail transaction. And whether you like it or not, you're a movie actor now. You're not a stage performer. Now I have, uh, gosh, I don't know, probably 30 years background in perf live performance in front of groups. I've done a lot of television and I got my start in radio. And radio, I will have to admit, 
is still my favourite medium of all time. I wouldn't mind at all spending my old age just uh, doing the announcing in some little regional radio station someplace quiet. Uh, that would make me very happy. Um, and my preference is live performance because you get a buzz and an energy from the group that you don't get from pre-recorded. I have colleagues who are in the film and television business who wouldn't agree with me. And that's just horses for courses. But we all have to adjust now to their world uh, and not our world. Um, and if, if you notice me looking down, it's because I'm trying to make sure that what I say correlates to the notes you can have a copy of later on if you want to. One thing that Professor Rosavi was saying before we went to air, uh, and it's something I want to talk about now, but I want to quote the professor if I may. She said, somehow, somehow we're all movie producers now. How did that happen? How do we all turn into movie producers? Um, I think that's a very penetrating observation that to succeed in this virtual world, you really need to get used to constant content production. The sort of thing the TV stations did 10 years ago, you now have to do with your home computer and sometimes with your cell phone. And those cell phones are more powerful than a lot of home computers, by the way, in terms of production and telecasting capability. But it's constant content production that rewards those who choose to fully participate. So in your content production, make sure there's a reward there for those who fully participate that's not there for those who partly participate. You can do that by building in a reward at the beginning, by building in a reward at the end, but we don't do things unless there's violence. Um, we don't work hard for the teacher unless you know the teacher gives us a gold star at the end of that time. So be sure that you are rewarding the behavior that you want and the behavior that you want is full attention, not half attention, not pretend attention. More about that in a minute. Um, the biggest challenge is bringing the whole team along with you. Old people, young people, different genders, different cultures, different languages, different cultural paradigms, all using the same platform. They're all going to have a different experience. And it is much, and that's always been true for leaders, but it is much harder for you to know now because you'd have to be a pretty um, courageous sort of individual to attend a physical meeting, yawn cavernously, lean back, put your feet on the desk, pull out a book and start reading it. That's a bit ruder than most people are willing to be. Well, people are doing all that stuff online and more, and you don't know because they turned on their avatar and then because they were bored and they went out and they fed the dog and they checked their kids' homework, they checked their shopping list, they figured out what they're gonna watch on Netflix tonight. But as far as you know, they're paying attention because all you're seeing is like that, an avatar, a still picture, and in fact, you can even get moving avatars that do this kind of thing. <laughs> and the person hasn't been near the webinar for, for ages. So it is harder for you to get people's attention, harder to retain it, and harder to know if you're succeeding. Bringing the whole team up to competency is really important. Um, engagement is much more of a pre-planned, succinct appeal to the individual. And although I hate to say it, you will need some performance skills so if you want to work on your performance skills, you should work on your performance skills. It would be nice to think the content is always enough. And after all, you are the entrepreneur, so you deserve some respect for that. And you have authority, leadership, knowledge, competency, skill, passion, energy. They should be enough to get people's undivided attention. Well, they're not. Not in the virtual world. You have to put a little bit of sugar in the medicine to make it go down. Uh, I would strongly invest in, in, invest in buyers rather, uh, investing a little bit in physical performance skills, which is simply a matter of being able to perform with comfort in front of the camera, rather than stare at the lens like you're trying to hypnotize it because you think that's how you make eye contact the whole time. But the actual effect of it, if you're watching is really, really creepy or to constantly be looking for your notes, like what was I gonna say next? And you convey the image, although it's not true, you convey the image that you couldn't care less. So why should your viewer care? So practice these skills and rehearse the voice as well. We just finished a webinar on that today, actually. Um, I had a colleague, a friend, Greg St. James, who was the, one of the top uh, DJs, disc jockeys in Detroit for many years and counts among his personal friends, the likes of Debbie Harry and all the Stones, particularly Ronnie Wood. He's still in good touch with all of them today. He has a, a Ronnie Wood original picture up on his, his wall of his office, actually. And Greg was talking to us about professional voice performance. Um, rehearse, 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 record yourself, play it back. You'll probably hate it. A lot of performers do, I do. You have to get over it. Um, the only way you'll know if you're uh, umming uh, all the time and if uh, your eyes are 
you know, wondering and you're leaving disconcerting pauses in what you say, it's to see it back again. You're not aware of these things when you do them. So record, replay, get better. Guess what? Greg St. James didn't become one of the nation's top voice actors and voice performers overnight. And for that matter, neither did Debbie Harry. They all worked their tails off for years to get good. So you need to do the same practice and rehearse. If you want a wonderful example of the voice at its very best, go online and look for a British actor named Richard Burton, B-U-R-T-O-N, film and television actor, reciting a poem by Dylan Thomas called Fern Hill. And if you doubt the power of the spoken voice to bring words alive and to compel attention, listen to Fern Hill, it'll change your mind. I challenge you to wander off halfway through Fern Hill, bored, and go and make yourself a cup of coffee. You're not going to do that. Your coffee's going to go cold. You won't even notice. Now, we can't all perform like Burton. He was probably the greatest voice performer of his time. But listen to Fern Hill and learn some tricks for getting people's attention is the best advice I can give you. Um, and if you don't imagine, it's, it's about childhood. It's about growing up on a farm in England. But if uh, you don't find that that brings it vividly alive to you, listening to that work performed in the voice, then I don't know what else to say to you. Just, just listen to Fern Hill. Just do it. And you'll know what I'm talking about. Three big tricks for leading virtual teams. Firstly, take advantage of the fact that it's a personal communication for each and every attendee. It's a personal experience. Take advantage of that. There's a film called The King's Speech, which I will admit is about an Australian. It's about a guy named Lionel Logue, who was a real guy. And he taught Queen Elizabeth's father how to do public speaking. Her father was terrified of it. And the best advice that's in the movie at the end, when he has to address the whole nation, millions of people, he says, forget about the whole nation, forget about millions of people. If you have something to say, say it to me. So when you have something to say on the air and you want that personal question, that personal connection, say it to someone, a specific imaginary someone on the other end who's friendly and who's listening to you. It'll make a huge difference to your performance. Use multiple approaches. Make sure you reach people verbally and visually because people operate in different ways. Don't be shy to use props and to have a little bit of fun. Now, just so that you know I'm not making this up, I actually have a collection of props that are here and available to me. So if I want to say, when you try to run a team, don't let yourself get nervous. Don't go running all over the place like a squirrel. Well, <laughs> it helps to have a squirrel. <laughs> make people laugh, make it different. Human brains tune out the ordinary, they tune out the repetitive, they tune out everything they can. So you either have to have original content or original presentation or both. But mundane content, mundane presentation, that's when whoever it might be, might be your investor, might be a customer, might be a colleague, might be your audience. That's when they go and make a coffee <laughs> and they come back 10 minutes later. Virtual skill sets are not the same as face-to-face. -face. If you're a mathematician, and you'll allow me to use some set theory. The sets overlap. They're self-similar, but they're not completely congruent. There, there are some differences in the skill. And the biggest thing to remember is that it's retail, not wholesale. Here are some differences between virtual teams and regular teams that you might want to think about. First of all, um, butts in seats. Uh, you're looking at the invisible. <coughs> Input's invisible and therefore you have to judge by output. Now that's actually a good discipline because too much instruction in the past has been judged by input. And we all know that when we fill out happy sheets, was the instructor on time? Were they well dressed? Um, did, you know, did, did it look like they'd showered at least sometime in the past week? And we fill these things out and we go, yes, 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 it was all great. These are called happy sheets and they mean nothing because the important thing is outcome and results. And now that's the only tool you have. So be sure you're watching outcome and results. Get feedback, be inclusive. Make sure people know that they are both listened to and heard. The number one thing people want when they're in an audience being addressed that is not addressed is to feel seen. I'm going to say that again, to feel seen. If you can make people feel seen, you will have their, their input and their energy and their commitment. So ask questions, stop, check understanding, use whatever technology, polls, chats, whatever technology is available to you online. And I see people uh, jumping in on the chats. And uh, I see we have Ashley from Rockville who found out about this and Marisol who found out the same way and Justin and I'm just picking a few at random. 
chat feedback is wonderful. It helps me know there are real humans out there. Why is that good? Because it changes my energy, because it improves my performance, and it will improve yours too. Trust me, this will help you. Knowing there are real humans on the other side makes all the difference. Technology. Uh, human connection is really important. For every technology screw up you have, you'll lose about half your audience. So the first time you go, oh, hang on, wait a minute, I've frozen. And uh, gosh, is this the right channel? Um, Rebecca, how do I do chat again? Is it down the bottom? You just lost half your audience. And the next time I do that, like, oh, um, what about questions? Where do I find the questions, Rebecca? Is that some other box somewhere here? You just lost another half of your audience. Now you're down to a quarter of your audience. Um, so don't do that. Get on hand beforehand. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Do what the pros do. Um, how do you think anybody gets good at this? I wasn't born able to speak this way. It was practice. Um, practice, practice, practice. Work with people who are better than you are and rehearse and record and test your technologies left, right and centre before you go to air, not afterwards. Um, hire a, techn a technician to help you if you possibly can. It is worth anything they charge you. Even if you're a penniless entrepreneur with $300 in the bank and you're the only employee, <laughs> spend your money on a technician because they're the ones that make you look good. Um, mental health status is very important. Encourage the celebration of success. Provide feedback on output. People are desperately short of feedback right now. If you doubt that, let me ask you this question. What's so bad about jail? I mean, we all assume jail's bad. We all assume, you know, it's a bad place. We don't want to go there. Why? Why is jail bad? Because if you think about it, they put a roof over your head. They give you three meals a day. Um, yes, I know prisons can be dangerous places. I've done a lot of work with maximum security prisons on Team Dynamics myself in the past. But if you're an ordinary prisoner, jail is not a particularly dangerous place. It's mostly just very, very boring. So why do we hate jail so much? And the answer, of course, is the deprivation of liberty, of choice, of freedom of movement, of freedom of association. That's what makes jail such a continuing popular yeah. punishment in so many societies around the world. What are people experiencing now in lockdown? Yep, limited social connection, limited choice, limited movement, limited variety, limited control. Our own videographer, yes, I do have a videographer to, you know, we all need help to look good. Uh, our company has a videographer. Once it described it only two days ago to me as lockdown is like jail with benefits. <laughs> And I thought that was wonderful. You're talking to people who are stir crazy. Their mental health is not good. Uh, they desperately need celebration of success and providing a feedback on output. If you can do that, you'll make their day. Um, careful observation of behavior is the real key. Watch people's eyes, look at their body language. This is attentive. This is, this is not. <laughs> um, audit the feedback constantly. Without the team buzz, and you can't have the team buzz right now, Human connection is king. Here are some tricks to know for facilitation. And by the way, if you uh, have some questions, you should be thinking about those questions uh, uh, right now. I mean, I'm, I'm probably about two thirds of the way through. We're right on time. But uh, I don't know about uh, you, but with me, I always hate it when they don't tell you till the end that they're ready for questions. Because then you go, oh, oh no, what are my questions? You start writing them down. Don't do that. If you have a question, write it down now or put it in the chat channel, which is that way, <laughs> that way. And uh, we'll go back and look at the chat channel. Rebecca, um, you could do me a huge favor as I'm speaking by scanning through the chat channel and picking out anything you see that looks like a question. So I don't miss one and offend someone because it's mixed in with general comments like, you know, good evening and isn't it a beautiful day? So questions. So John, go. yes, actually, you know, not to offend myself, but I actually had two questions that are in the chat form right now. Um, and uh, I'll do the first one is, uh, so when you do want people to engage and you were talking about, you know, kind of some of the mental health things and people mm. being distracted, do you, have you learned anything about how you can get people to um, engage any strategies or tips about that wisdom? Yep. I'll take you right back to the plumber who's been asked to put in your hot water system and you're taking one tool away from them and then another and another. And all they're left with in the end to put the whole thing in is a, is a plastic fork. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the situation we're in. We've had one human communication tool after another taken away from us. So how do you do that, Rebecca? You use what's left. What's left? Three things. The face, 
the hands and the voice. Mm. Now, face is limited because if you're in a Brady Bunch type screen where your face is small, your eyes are pinpoints and the communication available from that is therefore somewhat limited. Hands are only there if you do it conscious and deliberately. So here's my first hint for you. Bring in the hands where you can because you'll get people's attention. So if you want to say to people, look, the problem we've got in this company is our performance was great before COVID. And since then, it's just gone down, down, down. And there doesn't seem to be any bottom. Bring in the hands, you have people's attention. Same way if you model attention with the camera, your relationship with the camera should be like your relationship with a person. So you don't just stare at the camera because somebody told you to look directly into the camera. That's bad advice. It's actually creepy as hell. What you do instead is sometimes look at the camera, sometimes not as you would with a person. Face and hands and voice and practice, practice, practice. Um, voice has so much capability. We don't really understand it until we rehear radio shows like War of the Worlds, where an American actor named Orson Welles had the entire, and please don't do this, but he had the entire population in New York in a flat, frenzied panic, thinking that they were really being invaded by aliens and flying saucers. Now, all the man was doing was reading a script, but he was one of the best voice performers of this time or any time. And he had people really believing it. Uh, mm -hmm. Listen to Fern Hill by Dylan Thomas, as read by Sir Richard Burton. You'll know what I mean. The voice has tremendous power. Yelling over people is not nearly as effective as lowering your voice. Those of us who are educated by the nuns will remember that when the nun lowered her voice, that was when you really better pay attention. <laughs> so, so, have, so John, there's another question here from Kayla. Yeah. Um, who uh, asks, do you feel like there's a disconnect when you're trying to reach younger demographics, younger people, and, uh, and then a follow-up as a young business owner, how, how can I reach a specific target audience? I'll give you two answers to that. The okay. first one is controversial. Um, you'll read a lot about Gen X, Gen Y, Gen P to the N minus two, Gen Pi squared minus two RX, less the number you first thought of, as though there is a new species of humans extant on the earth that has never existed before. That, guys, is a load of rubbish. There is no scientific evidence at all to suggest that human beings have somehow morphed in the last few years. We, as humans, have not changed since the time of the pyramids. What's changed is the situation. What's changed is the environment and our adaptation to that environment. So young people are doing what young people have always done. They've adapted to their environment, no different, but it's a different environment. It's not the one you knew. It's not the one, if you're my age, you're 60, it's not the environment your kids knew. It's the environment your grandkids knew. So my advice to you is don't let yourself get behind the curve. Stay up with the current environment. Play around with TikTok. It's not gonna kill you. <laughs> learn out or learn what Instagram is for. That's not going to kill you either. The more you can sample the environment in which your audience works, be they young or old, the better you'll understand their adaptations to that environment. Don't get too hung about Gen X, Y, this, Gen Z, that. Um, I remember listening to a talk from a brilliant young person on the presidential management program, which is kind of an elite program for leaders of the future. And she was about 23, 24. And she said, I'm so sick of people treating me like I'm Gen something. Just treat me like a person, but accept that I'm adapting to the contemporary reality, not the reality of 20 years ago. People don't change, times do, was what she said. 23 years old. How smart do you have to be to understand that when you're 23? And she was absolutely dead right. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, how do you make sure you're covering the waterfront? Have a diverse group of people around you. Make sure they're diverse in every way so that you hear many voices. In Team Results, we have, at least, we have three different generations covered. We have a uh, technical advisor who's 17 years old. We, and boy, does she know what she's doing. We have a social media specialist who's a graduate of the Southern Management Program. Shout out to Layla Gilbert Rivera. <laughs> and she's in her early 20s. Uh, we have a couple of managers who are all in their late 30s, early 40s, and I'm 60. So when, before we do anything, we test it's gonna work in the generations. Um, follow. Um, hear as many different voices as you can, have a diverse group. Convergent groups make bad decisions. This is a well-known scenario. It's actually called, it actually has a name in psychology, in group psychology. It's a well-known problem. Look it up in Google if you don't believe me. It is referred to as the Bay of Pigs scenario. Pigs as in oink oink. The Bay of Pigs scenario. Um, subtitle, how really dumb decisions get made. 
And the answer is lack of diversity is one of the biggest causes of really stupid decisions. And the Bay of Pigs was a classic example of that. Read up on it, you'll find it fascinating. Don't do that. Any other questions before I go on, Rebecca? You're muted. Sorry, I had myself okay. muted. That was okay. I, so uh, Kayla says, thank you. Um, and then there's a question, how you were talking about celebrating, how important mm. it is to celebrate. Have you found any good ways to do that? Yes. Um, in my parents' generation, um, and the people who grew up who were adults in the 50s, there was a product called Brill Cream. It was one of the very first attempts at hair gel. And it was pretty much the only, I mean, now you can get a hundred kinds of gel and stuff to put in your hair. But back then, if you were a man, it was Brill Cream or nothing. I never used it, but it was for, you know, holding your hair in place if you wanted to look pretty. Um, it was an enormously successful product. And the reason it was successful was they had one of the best advertising slogans in the history of anything. Do you remember the slogan, Rebecca? Want to do this together? You're, you're muted. You're muted. I just remember. I just right. yeah. I just remember that it was that you. My my grandmother had little doilies on her chair so that it wouldn't get to, on to her chairs. But I don't remember the um the slogan. Yeah, I mean, who's kidding? Who? It was a tube of grease. That's all it was. But it was a successful. The slogan was a little dabble do ya. Mm -hmm. How brilliant is that? Um, it's the same with uh, acknowledging people. A little dabble do ya. It doesn't take much. A very small amount applied in the right place. Well done. Thanks for the viewpoint. Finally, Sarah, somebody said it. Thank you so much, because I know others were thinking it. That kind of feedback is what's needed. It has to be genuine. It has to come from the heart. You don't need to overpraise people, but it's all to do with acknowledging people and letting them know that they are seen rather than treating them as an audience, like it was one big gestalt entity with a giant brain and 50 arms and legs. No, it's individual people. It's a retail transaction every single time. So small amounts done strategically needn't cost you anything. Um, and if you are going to give people something, make sure it's something that is unique that they can't find somewhere else and make sure it's cheap so they aren't embarrassed. Um, challenge coins are wonderful for that for your organization, but anything like that is just a really nice thing. I've seen people almost in tears because they were given something that was worth three bucks, but it meant validation to them. Does that answer the question, Rebecca? And you're on mute. Oh, there you go. There we go. I uh, guess it does, but I'm curious now to know what a challenge coin is. Maybe challenge someone coin, else is interested. Challenge coins are a tradition that began in the military, but they went viral. Um, and it's a, uh, a challenge coin is, um, I'll, I'll go and get one in a minute, is a metal coin. It's about an inch and a half wide and it's got logos. You know, it could have your company logo on one side, your slogan on the other, and you give them to somebody who's done something really worth recognizing. So the salesman of the month or, you know, a big supporter of your organization, you say, here, this is for you. Now, of course, you can't buy one. That's the thing about them. They're unique. So they spread from the military to the uniform services, from the uniform services to the government, from the government to the commercial world, and then on outwards. So lots of people have them now. I have a box of challenge coins on my wall that represent major moments in my life and times people have given me things. So, well, you know, thanks for being a, I have a special forces one up there, which is very precious to me because I did some work with the special forces and they, they coined me. Um, and, uh, you know, what did that cost them? Three dollars. Um, but it was, a, it was a, a watershed event for me and for others whom they've coined. So simple little gestures like that. Does that answer the question? Yes, it yes, absolutely does. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no other questions, I'm going to go on with a couple of other facilitation tricks that might be useful to people as entrepreneurs. Does that sound reasonable to you? Sounds good. First thing I'll tell you is facilitation gets joked about a lot. Um, if you want to see some truly hilarious jokes about facilitators, look at the Dilbert comic mm. and the, the terrible things they do to Timmy, the facilitator. In the end, they stab him through the heart with one of his own pencils, um, bury him somewhere and eat the donut that he was trying to use for a demonstration of something to do with team dynamics. And all these famished programmers just fall hungrily on the donut and eat it instead of using it. It's <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly funny. Um, and I, I get the joke, I really do. But in a virtual world, we have meetings, facilitation is essential. You have to make sure people get a word in edgeways to understand how attention works, to keep the objective in front of you at all times. Why are we having this meeting in the first place? To manage the technology in a smart, conservative way. 
so that we don't all get overexcited and jump on a news video and suddenly the system crashes. Um, to audit people constantly, who's paying attention, who's bored, who are you pretty sure wanted off 15 minutes ago and they haven't been back since. To steer the conversation for time, it's much easier to run out of time on a virtual environment than it is in a face-to-face -face environment. You don't have people to give you the old, you know, the old, you have to do it yourself. Uh, why when you perform on television, there's always someone at the back of the studio that can't be seen. They've got their face to you and they're, uh, never mind what these signals mean, it's a, like a television thing, but they're doing things like this and things like this and things like this and then the other way and then things like that and things like that. And that, that's a language, it all means something. Um, and you as the performer are completely lost without it. You don't have that. Um, make sure that there are gaps between overs, between conversations. So I say that's a good idea. And Rebecca says, not only that, but something else. But in the process, somebody else can't get a word in edgeways. It's hard in, enough in face-to-face. -face. Technology makes it really easy to make it impossible to get a word in edgeways. What happens? People go passive. They go solid. They give up. They stop listening. So somebody has to make sure that that happens. Somebody has to look out for over-talking. People who talk all the time and never let anybody else in. How do you silence them without offending them? Uh, there are ways to do that. Um, using, using inclusion strategies and invitation that works but doesn't embarrass people. Like, Sarah, you haven't said anything so far. Well, that's nice. What if Sarah has a speech defect and she doesn't want to speak? You've got to allow for these things. These are all skills. Um, that's why you need a facilitator, folks. You need someone to run the meeting. It can't be you if you want to contribute. If you don't want to contribute, fine, run the meeting. But if you want to contribute, you need someone else to facilitate the meeting and make sure they know how to do it. And if you need any help with that, Rebecca, um, you can send any of the Southern Management people to us. I won't charge you a penny, but I will, put, I will point those people in the direction of some good facilitation skill sets they can acquire. It's not hard, it takes practice. It's just a type of performance um, like any other performance, it's learnt by doing. Uh, the reason I know what to do when I'm performing is because I've made just about every stupid mistake it's humanly possible to make, uh, usually more than once. <laughs> um, and eventually you learn. Don't feel silence when you run groups. People are terrified of silence. All it means is that people are thinking. It's good. Thinking is good. So um, if you say so, uh, what do you think about, you've all seen our strategic plan for the next year for this, for as we grow this business out, what do you think? And the answer is, it's naturally disconcerting. Um, learn to write it. Make friends with silence. Uh, it means you've propelled people into thought. Someone will eventually speak, I promise you, and it mustn't be you. If you speak first, then you lose. You wait till someone speaks and the floodgates will open. Um, there are some tricks to do with that that are more subtle than that, but all I want to say for now is don't feel silence. Now, the Queen of England has a wonderful saying, which I'm going to steal and pass on to you. Her saying is, um, is um, how does it go now? That's right. Country first, duty second, self last. And she's been known to say that to some of the royals who get a bit uppity, like, do you know who I am? And the Queen says, Psh, nobody cares who you are. <laughs> self last duty first um to you i say um the seriousness of your subject your audience first meet their needs the serious of your subject second it might be very serious but again self last be serious without being self-serious put significance on things without putting significance on yourself you can make people laugh at their worst moment you can make people smile and feel human energy in the worst possible situations. And you do that by not putting significance on yourself, by letting go of your ego, going with your, pre with your preparation all the way up, your defences all the way down, and don't put importance on yourself or on your message because if I have something really significant to say, and you better pay attention now because this is important, you're going to switch off like a light switch. <laughs> Whereas if you're willing to be a little bit human, say, so do you realise the last time we ran this project was probably the biggest screw up in the entire history of human endeavour on the face of the planet Earth? Let's please not do that again. Um, if you can say that to them, you can tell people that they, are, that they screwed up horribly. But if you do it in a human way without significance, you will be amazed at what you can get away with. Um, so self, uh, 
It's of it's people first, mission second. Uh, by the way, the reason it's people first and mission second is it's not a touchy feely reason. There's always going to be another mission, <laughs> but if you lost the people, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So it's people first, mission second, self last. Um, some organisations that are very good at doing that right now. The FDA is a client of ours. I admire them greatly. They are the point people for COVID. Somehow they've managed to keep their sense of humour and yet focus on something that's terribly serious. Um, That's down to a number of visionary leaders within the FDA and to the example that they set. You lead not by talking. People couldn't care less what you say. Entrepreneurs, they could not care less what you say. They're only looking at two things. The first of those is your attitude. And the second of those is your example. Lead by attitude and by example. And if there's any disparity between what you're saying on the one hand and your attitude or example on the other, ain't nobody going to follow what you said. They're going to follow your attitude and your example, right? No personal conversations while you're in the shop. No cell phone calls to your girlfriend while you're in the shop. And then the next thing you're on the cell phone to your wife, yakety yak, what do you want for dinner? Guess what they're going to do the minute your back's turned? What do you think they're going to do? Um, so lead. Proper facilitation, folks, is much more important in virtual teams because of the limitations you have to communication. You're going to need some help with that. So tap someone to facilitate. doesn't matter who they are. Um, I've got a couple of practical takeaways for you and a reading list. And then I'd love to answer any questions or comments people might have. So, Rebecca, we need to finish in uh, 17 minutes. Is that correct? That is correct. Perfect timing. And, uh, and yeah, and I'll just uh, remind everybody, too, if you do have questions, just pop them in the chat yes. room. Um, that way you don't need to feel like you're interrupting and, and I'll do the interrupting for you. I'll be the facilitating interrupter. Thank you. Um, and, and I couldn't do this without, without Rebecca and she couldn't do it without me. It's a double act, folks. If you can make it a double act when you run team processes online, it's just so much easier. You can't always do it, but if you watch any of Team Results' webinars, I don't know if I'm allowed to advertise them, so I won't unless I'm told I may. But if you do watch any of our webinars, it's never one person. It's a double act. Why? Because we have each other's backs. That's why. <laughs> Some practical and it's, a lot, it's a lot less stressful when there are two of you, too, I'll tell you. <laughs> no kidding. Rebecca, if I can invite them to our regular free webinars, I will. But if it's a conflicting message, then I won't. So you tell me. No, um, please, please do. These are these are right. webinars, and I know that some of our students have actually attended them and found them to be really useful. Um, and they're at no cost. And I think once you sign up for one, you get the notices about the the future one. So please go you for do. it. All right. Well, I'll tell you that at the end. That can be a suspenseful thing. We are two okay. minutes away from Rebecca digging into your questions. So please follow her advice and tap in your questions, um, because we're going to be answering those between now and, and quitting time. Um, Five practical takeaways. Uh, First of all, virtual skill sets aren't the same as face-to-face. Just accept that and round out your skill sets to work in a virtual world. Virtual team leadership is retail, not wholesale. Um, Your oratorical skills addressing a group of people are great, but they're not going to be useful until about, you know, maybe next March, April, somewhere around there. Um, Right now, develop those retail skills. Um, Careful observation of behaviour is absolutely key. Um, You get your feedback from watching people. I'm talking to the screen, but I'm looking at the feedback screen over to my right. I'm looking at Rebecca's face all the time. Without feedback, you are lost. You are like flying a plane with no instruments in heavy fog in the Andes at 500 feet of altitude. Uh, Sooner or later, you'll look out the window and the very last thing you're going to see is a a mountain goat and it's going to be looking down at you. That's not good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, without team buzz please remember human connection is the king and team buzz has been taken away from you to a great degree Um, so human connection is your only hope right now Uh, all the tricks have been taken away from you and finally when you run team processes online have a facilitator find someone to help you run the session and that's how you avoid chaos and how you avoid looking stupid This is the reading list. Anything in yellow is a book that is directly relevant to things I've been talking about today, where you can check the provenance. Anything in white is somewhat less relevant, but still a book to do with teamwork and leadership. At this point, I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Professor Rizavi, and we're going to tackle your questions and comments. Over to you, (laughs) Professor. Thank you. So I actually don't see questions in the chat at this moment. I hope that you all are thinking about 
We should be taking advantage of John's expertise here. John knows a lot about the psychology of teamwork and um, has tons and tons of experience. And I'm assuming that you joined us today because you might have some questions about how to make this process easier or more interesting or more exciting. Um, so particular challenges that you all are facing, um, we'd love to hear about them. And uh, let's, uh, let's take advantage of John's, um, John's time here with us. Ashley asks if you have any tips for either persuading or building motivation. She's talking about um, working in a team when you're trying to motivate others to perform well, what might you be able to tell her? Any tips for motivating people? The biggest fallacy you'll hear about this, and uh, most of the books out there will, will perpetuate this fallacy, is that you can motivate someone. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> motivate you <laughs> um, any more than I can go to the bathroom for you. It, it makes an equal amount of nonsense. Um, the very most you can do is motivate yourself. So you need to put into people's hands the tools that they need to motivate themselves. And the most important of these and the three biggest complaints in the American workforce are, one, nobody listens to me. Two, nobody values me. And three, I don't feel like I'm in the room. So listen to people, validate them and put them in the room. And there is nothing they won't do for you. In fact, you have to watch your ethics a bit because they'll do anything for you, including bad things but they'll crawl over broken glass for you. Make sure that people feel included, make sure they're seen, make sure they're heard, make sure they're in the room and you will have their support the whole time. Understand that humans communicate spirit to spirit and therefore you can say almost anything to anyone as long as you respect the human spirit that's inside them and they respect yours. Do those things and people will climb mountains for you. Mm -hmm. What else? That is, yeah, that's really, really, really good advice and really wise. Um, uh, Marisol has a question about um, breaking silence in a room. What can you do? How do you break silence in a room? And she's talking also about uh, in the context she's using is in a classroom where professors split students into different rooms um, so they can work, but sometimes students are too shy to talk. So that's mm. actually a question that I had also. So I'd be really curious to hear your, your response. When you've got a really shy group of people, how you know what are some things you can do to get people talking? And the whole reason that Dustin Hoffman is an actor today is that when he was a child, he was so shy that his parents thought he was autistic, and so they took him to a special class for autistic kids, and that was when they discovered he could do voices and perform, and he still has a great deal of empathy for autism, which is why he does such a great, uh, a great job in the movie Rain Man. And there is some autism in his family as well. So he has a good understanding of it. So very shy people, it's kind of a mischaracterization. And it's why I'm not very fond of personality typing instruments because they classify people like they were cornflakes. And that was never the intention of some of the great thinkers in psychology like Jung. Jung would have been horrified, scandalized, mortified at the use of his research for any of those agendas. It was the opposite of everything he believed in. Jung believed that the human spirit was a religious entity. That was the essential belief that gathered Jung all of his ideas his whole life. So shy people, there are no shy people. There are just shy behaviors. Mm -hmm. There are no extroverted people. There are just extroverted behaviors. So when people are quiet, if you have a big, strong voice, one of the biggest favors you can do them is lend them your big, strong voice. Hey guys, I think we're missing something pretty important here. And that's anything that's better than that is you go to Sarah beforehand and you say, hey, Sarah, you're trying to tell us that there's a crack in the base of the rocket. The whole thing's going to blow up and kill everyone. I don't think anyone's listening to you. Now, do you want me to say that for you? Or would you just like me to tell them to shut the hell up so they can listen to you? And seriously, it'd be nice if they just shut up and listen to me. Right, I can do that. Hey, all of you, heads up, shut up. Sarah's got something to say. I have no problem doing that because I've been trained to use parade ground voice. So you can be... <laughs> You can lend a little of your strong voice to help someone who has a weak voice and maybe they'll lend your strong idea to your weak idea and maybe the space shuttle doesn't blow up. And by the way, that's not a meretricious example. That's exactly how that happened. Quiet people were not listened to. All right, somebody said, the challenge coin is an awesome idea and, and how do you do it? There are companies out there that will make challenge coins for you. Uh, it should run out to about three or four dollars challenge coin if you want to make them for your organization. 
There are many, many companies that do it. I'm more than happy to tell you who we use and certainly team results. My company is very happy with them. Um, if you want to get hold of me afterwards, I'll be happy to give you their uh, details. And they'll allow you to do full color on both sides and they'll also work up the design for you and they won't charge you a fortune for doing the design either, that's included. They do all the artwork as part of it. So I, I like them and they've certainly made thousands of challenge coins for us. How do you deal with someone who's consistently bought out? They're, they're just never there. They just never participate. And as far as you know, they're feeding the dog because they're sure as heck not participating. Uh, the answer is retail transaction, folks. You're gonna have to be courageous. Colin Powell said being a leader sometimes means pissing people off. You're gonna have to have a conversation with that person, even if it's an awkward conversation. But pick a private moment pick a way to do it that doesn't embarrass them, ask them what's going on and ask them how you can meet their needs. But in the end, if you're an entrepreneur and you have someone who's consistently not participating, then they're not helping your cause, no matter how good they are. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, follow-up, I'm gonna type a little message, which is gonna say the wednesdaywebinar.com. And that's literally spelled the way it sounds. And this is an outreach that we do. It's free, it's meant to be for the public good. There's no sales message, there's no sales pitch. Um, it's just about teamwork and leadership. And we do one of these every two weeks. The most recent one was today. If you go to the wednesdaywebinar.com tomorrow, not, not yet, but if you go there tomorrow, you will find today's webinar sitting there recorded and you can watch it. If you go there now, you'll find the last one from two weeks ago, which is still a pretty good webinar. They all have uh, guest speakers. Today, we had a real celebrity guest. It was Greg St. James, who I've mentioned earlier who is, I think, one of Detroit's leading DJs and has been a voice actor for 40 years. He's the voice of C-SPAN. So we've all heard his voice. We just didn't know it was Greg. And he was giving you some pro tips for controlling rooms with the voice when the voice is all you have. Mm -hmm. So the webinars are on that theme. They're every two weeks. Sign up for one, you'll get an invitation to the other. No marketing, no advertising. It's just supposed to be outreach to help people. Um, feel very free to join in. If you want to contact me for any reason, I will give you my email address here as well. You're quite welcome to do that. Uh, Rebecca makes all of us mentors for the program uh, promise that if we become mentors for the program, we will accept people's connection requests on LinkedIn. Um, so normally I don't accept any requests where I don't know the people, but the Southern Management uh, Group is an exception to that. I thank you, John, for sharing what you have learned about, um, about this crazy world that we live in and some, some really, really helpful ideas.